understand the difference between your job and your role. So your job might be, you know, head of community marketing, fine. But your role in that room at that moment might be a little different than that. So understand that your job and your role in these moments might not always be the same. All right, everybody, welcome to the Dia Bondi Show, a big podcast for folks with goals. I'm Dia Bondi, longtime leadership communications coach and catalyst. Yes, I said catalyst. And also creator project Ask Like an Auctioneer with a goal to help 1 million women and underrepresented folks ask for more and get it so they can resource their dreams and reach their goals faster and importantly, have a really good time doing it. And I'm joined today, just like every time we record this podcast, with my uh, by my on-air producer, Baby Arthur. Hi, Baby A. Hey, Dia. How's it going today? It's going good. I am kind of turned up, though, I have to say. Oh, yeah? Turned up? Turned up a little yeah. bit. Yeah. 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 Tell me about it. Here's the thing. Expectations are a problem for us. Okay. I, I, I think I know what you mean. So yesterday, in one of my coaching sessions with a founder CEO, first-time founder CEO, he shared with me... He shared with me that um, that he's been given so much feedback in his leadership that he basically doesn't even know how to be anymore. Like that he carved, and, and this is something I see over and over again, that we always focus on, when, we, when we're worried about expectations, we will carve ourselves down to just a tiny nub version of ourselves. I'm, I'm noticing that this week, just in my life in general, that the folks that I'm collaborating with on various projects are so worried about the expectations that they've drifted away from what their actual, ta- what it is that they bring to the table that is uniquely theirs, a, a way to actually survive doing hard things through, you know, we survive doing hard things by holding on to who we actually are and what matters to us. And expectations can thwart that hard. And the only way I see over and over, not the only way, but one of the key ways that we can manage expectations, deal with expectations, reject expectations, grapple with expectations, and hold on to ourselves in the face of it is to be willing to actually disappoint. And here's an example of the upside of that, of the upside of that. I had a, I had a discovery call with a potential client not long ago, and um, they're like a large ad agency. They are the AOR for some of the biggest brands that you have in your closet right now. And um, we were talking about, you know, what I do around communications, leadership, voice development, et cetera, um, as well as some of my ask for more and get it stuff. And in the conversation, the head of learning and development was asking me a question about uh, the kinds of coaching I do. And he was saying, here's what's, here's what's kind of coming up that we might need help with. And he named something. And I said, okay, and give me another one. And he named something else. And, I, and then he named something else. And I said, well, you know what? Those aren't me. Those, I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. Here's, here's what it is that I do and who I am and what I bring. And I knew that I was not meeting an expectation in that moment. Like it felt like I had a choice of saying like, well, I could probably do that because the truth is I probably could. Many of us could do the thing that is kind of off kilter for us. We can figure out a way to do it. We can step up to the plate. We can perform, you know, in, in the face of those expectations. We can figure out a strategy. We can deliver the goods. But in that moment, I made a choice to say, no, I know that that's an expectation that you have around uh, a need that you have and maybe an expectation that you're sharing with me that you might want me to fulfill for you, but those aren't actually aligned to who I am, what I do and the impact I want to have in the world. Here's what I do. And and as soon as I was done explaining uh, to him sort of the truth of where I'm at my best and how I can bring the most value. I hate that phrase, but nonetheless, like uh, bring the most value. Um, he said, you know, Dia, what's crazy is I talked to hundreds of coaches as a learning and development lead. And I like, it's so refreshing to have you say what you don't do. Because so many coaches I talk to say, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. They say they can do everything. They're doing mindset coaching. They're doing time management coaching. They're doing productivity coaching. They're doing etc. And um, 
And it's really, it's really quite refreshing to hear you say what you don't do. And it helps me really understand where to put you so that you, you know, so that we can kind of get the best out of what we need and what you offer. It, but it took me being willing to go, ooh, you have, an, you have a bunch of thoughts about what I am and that's actually not true and have the courage to say, no, thank you. All right. You know what's crazy, Arthur? What's that? I was just looking at um, how the podcast is performing and it's really interesting. Our all time, our most downloaded episode is the episode called How to Goals If You Don't Have One, which I think is kind of interesting because I often assume that folks have goals and um, and maybe y'all don't have goals or maybe you have five goals and you're struggling with which one is the one that is, I don't want to say right, but maybe right for you. Mm-hmm. So if you're not one of those folks who have um, listened yet to the episode titled How to Goals If You Don't Have One, go ahead and jump over there. I think it's like episode six and check it out. Um, because, you know, our version also of goals is not just about like something you could put in an OKR, an objective and a key result. But instead, you know, it, it can be about life experiences and lots of different things. This show is completely about helping you reach your goals, whatever they might be, even if they're about doing less of something. So yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting that that was the most downloaded so far. Yeah, that's interesting. If you haven't heard that episode yet, you can go back into the archive and take a listen. You can. And, you know, if you really like what we're doing here, you can subscribe, rate, and review and help the Dia Bondi show reach more people. You can even give us a call at 341-333-2997 and uh, ask us a question, which is what we have going on today. Ooh. So I know you say every time we have a, a listener question that you're nervous to hear it. Ugh. And, you know, that you might not, uh, maybe you won't have advice for them this time. You know, it's kind of crazy. I feel like that every time I step on stage, every time I walk into a new coaching engagement, every time I set up to record something, I record a course, I work with a, you know, whatever. I just, there's always that little moment where it's not doubt. It's just a little bit of like, I know it's, it's like, you know, you're good at this. And it, there's like anticipation combined with like, maybe this is the one where it's not going to work. And for all of you who have that feeling all the time as well, I'm with you, number one. And number two, it's natural. Like, you know, when I work with folks who in the communication space, like there's some expectation too often that we're not supposed to be nervous before we take a stage or get in front of that critical audience, whether it's, you know, fundraising or a TED talk. Yeah, I, I, I had the same thing whenever I'm doing a video production where I'm like, maybe this is the one where it just all goes off the rails and, you know, we end up with nothing. Yeah. I've heard horror stories from other producers and filmmakers about that sort of thing. It hasn't happened to me yet, but, you know. Knock wood. I mean, yeah. the, other, the other part of that is like, if you recognize your own process – and you name it and claim it, which is something I really like to do, you don't have to make it a problem. You can just be like, oh, there it is. It just showed up. That's this part. This is where I go for a walk, or this is where I drink a glass of water, or this is where I put a fresh shirt on. Like Whatever the thing is that helps you ritualize and sort of name and claim, and um, you know, and that feeling can also be just as, you know, a signifier that something, that what you're about to do is really important to you. Right. And speaking of which, what I'm about to do to respond to this, to the, to the answer to the question that you're about to play is important to me. It's important yeah. to me that listeners get something out of, um, you know, the questions and the struggles that other folks who listen to the show are going through in their everyday careers, lives, and businesses. So, so hit me. All right, here we go. Hey, Dia. Um, I would love your advice on something that comes up often for me. I work in marketing on the creative side, and last week I had a meeting with a few of our executives to finalize some details of a project we were working on that was supposed to launch this week. But we only got about 10 minutes into the meeting before it was basically back to square one, and we were revisiting the entire strategy, and I left the meeting feeling uh, really deflated. 
you know, I had tried to redirect the conversation to get us back on track, um, and then it ended up coming off as, you know, defensive. And I was just really taken by surprise because we had gone through, you know, several rounds of feedback and approvals, and now we're starting from scratch. Um, so I guess my question for you is, uh, what advice do you have on communicating when things go off the rail, and how do you do that without being defensive? Um, I'm a big fan of the show, and I can't wait to hear your perspective on this. Thanks. Great question. Relatable. So for I just want to start by saying um, thank you for calling in. And if you are listening to the show right now and you have a question that you want to you want to send on in, please don't be shy. We're super friendly here. Uh, if you call the show, you, you literally get a voicemail. Nobody's going to pick it up. Um, you, you just leave a voicemail and um, you can leave it anonymously. You can leave your name if you'd like. It's really, really easy and um, – and and welcome. Let's just say that. So thank you, caller, for this question. It's a really beautiful one, and it's the one that a lot of us struggle with. When we go into those high-stakes meetings, we know our task is to move something forward, and holding it together and moving it forward in the face of lots of different voices and opinions and points of view can be really hard when you're the one that's, you know, in charge of the storytelling around what's going on in the project and also the one that's accountable for moving it forward. Um, I want to start by saying this stuff happens. Like sometimes it th- that can happen. Going back to square one can happen and sometimes it's the right thing to do even if it's painful for you. So, you know, we can have an expectation. Ha, <laughs> speaking of ex- expectations, expectations can ruin us as well when we go in with our own expectations and the gap between that expectation and what's actually happening in the room can can cause a little bit of self-sabotage. So w- we have to have the expectation um, that it can go, it can change. Things can change. And so it, it sometimes is that things go back, you know, backwards or back to square one. That does happen. If you want to influence the outcome of these conversations and if you want to communicate the story you need to tell to get the decisions you need to move things forward based on previous work, there's a couple of things that, you know, you can do. You can understand the difference. You can walk into those meetings, even in the content process, content development process when you're prepping for it, whether you're, you know, sharing previous work, your whatever the story is, the slides you put together to, to help us, you know, move a decision forward. You know, understand the difference between your job and your role. So your job might be, you know, head of community marketing, fine. But your role in that room at that moment might be a little different than that. Maybe your role in that moment based on the stage of the of the project is to be a, a facilitator of understanding. Maybe your role in that moment is to be – uh, is to be the 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 painter of the picture of the future. Maybe your role in that moment is to lower anxieties so that people have room to make a decision. Maybe your maybe your role in that moment is to be the clarity maker or the or the um, the questioner. So understand that your job and your role in these moments might not always be the same. That's number one. Number two is to recognize that especially when you're dealing with founder executives who are running and gunning all day long, they have thousands of decisions on their plate constantly from, you know, from people struggles to product struggles to marketing struggles to finance struggles. They are in, they are divided to a degree that is almost inhuman, <laughs> So, so we have almost it is, yes, it is unbelievable. I mean, who you're talking about, caller, um, that you spoke to in that, in that moment are often my clients and they are spread thin. So if your job is community marketing and your role in the room might be to, uh, the role in the room might, might be really important to the people making the decisions if you if you recognize how little context they might have, how little memory they might have, how little recognition of where we've been they might have because they're spread so thin. You can you can help bring them back into our current state 
by doing the storytelling necessary to get us present to what needs to happen now. And in that way, I mean to build context for them, to not assume that the moment that they log into that Zoom call or the moment they sit down and you start talking that they have, that they're right where you are. You've got to meet them where they are and then bring them where you want to go. That is one of my 21, by the way. If, if folks are listening, you can go to diabondi.com and get the 21 things you can do to have more impact in front of um, any audience at any time, anywhere. Um, and meeting folks where they are and then bringing them where you want to go is something that can help you keep forward momentum in that moment and not let things get off the rail because they might be coming in with from a totally different um, vantage point or lack of understanding that you thought they had last week, they don't have anymore. It's gone. Other things have replaced it. Meeting them where they are and reminding them of context and bringing them up to date, especially around helping them remember what decisions they already made and their rationales for having made those decisions. And elevating those that quote-unquote reminder to being something really, really important. Here's where we are in the project. Here's where we were. We decided on this strategy and you said yes because you thought X, Y, and Z. And so then we developed the concept into these three choices. We chose this one and you chose it because you said it was X, Y, and Z. So that folks you are talking to are reminded of how smart they are. They're reminded of the rationale that they use to make a decision. And that you elevate that storytelling. It's got to be brief, but it's got to be accurate so that we are all re-onboarded into where we are right now. And in that way, what you are doing is not convincing anybody of anything. You You are narrating the process for folks in the room who need to update and be reminded of their understanding of where they are, where we've been, and where we're going next. So understand the difference between your job and your role in the moment. Two, you've got to meet us where we are and build context. And three, don't be shy to be a narrator of the process so that we can all get brought along with you. If you can have these three things, um, you know, as a framework in your mind when you sit down to plan what that 40 minutes is going to be, what that 45 minutes is going to be, a half an hour, one hour, three hour strategy session, whatever it is, it might help you get a little bit of space from taking the decisions that might happen in the room personally. Now, one thing you might want to do to help facilitate that is sit for just a second, second and take an inventory of what questions you think your audience, these executives, the founders that you're walking in uh, to, to help move the process along, take an inventory of the questions you think they might have and make sure that those are addressed somewhere in somewhere in the story that you're going to tell with, uh, to them. And the, the big part of all of this is that when you bring people along, help them remember how smart they are. Help them remember what great decisions they had made up until this moment. Help them recall the rationales they used in the moments to say yes to one thing and no to another. When you can come from that perspective of your role in the room, when you can have empathy for how lost folks are the moment they start the meeting with you, and that you know the 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 pile on the the stack that they're dealing with every single day that is not part of the story you need to tell right now, you may be able to um, have a little bit more control of the moment because you've got some space from their decision being personal instead of their decision being an outcome of a whole bunch of other chaos or lack of understanding that they might be bringing to the table when you're picking up right where you left off. And then ultimately, you know, the impact. What is the impact that you want to have in the room? And if you can have the courage to speak from the heart and say the truth of where we are and where we need to go next, where you can narrate the process courageously by saying things like, um, this, is, this decision is different than where we landed on. Do we want to, you know, we've taken this decision another direction. Do we want to follow that direction or do we want to revisit the decision we made earlier? Just narrating the process can be a, an act of courage can be a thing that you speak from the heart with empathy. And it will put you more in control because you're making the implicit in those moments explicit. If they've pulled the conversation off the rails, you can say, wow, this is this is a very different outcome than I expected. Do we want to follow that or do we want to get back to where we were? 
narrating the process courageously might be, this decision will change the timeline on this project. Are we okay with that? And you're going into that with curiosity, not, not that white knuckle kind of control. So I think, caller, um, the last part of your question around uh, your being perceived maybe as defensive when you're trying to get it back on the rails is understandable. It's really hard when you go in with a set of expectations, a story to tell and a decision to be made and things go differently. If you can lead with curiosity and empathy and make explicit and clear the targets we're trying to hit and then facilitate the decisions and discussions, not explain and defend what needs to be done, you might have more success and you also might be able to hold things a little bit more lightly so that moments like this don't destroy you or you don't feel as if you have to be cornered into defending yourself. Instead, you can just lead with the empathy and curiosity that helps facilitate what needs to happen next, even if what needs to happen next is out of the expectation you had walking in the room. Sometimes forward can mean going sideways or going back two steps before you re-engage and go forward again. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Forward is never a straight line. Well, we're always going forward through time, even if we're going back to square one with a project. That's right. <laughs> well, I think that was great. That was re- I think that was really helpful. We'll, we'll chunk there. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Look, see, I did it. I did it again. All right. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. See you next time. This podcast is a production of Diabondi Communications, and it's produced and scored by me, Arthur Leon Adams III. You can like, share, rate, and subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Find us at diabondi.com or follow us on Instagram at The Diabondi Show. Want to shoot us a question for the show? Call us at 341-333-2997 and maybe you'll hear your question answered on a future episode. 